a man of unrestrained reason, Dr. Peter Bogosian. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. And it's good to see so many friends and so many new people. First, I'd like to thank the Portland State University Freethinkers for allowing me this opportunity to speak tonight. OK. Uh, thanks to Ryan for that very kind introduction. And thanks to Portland State University again for allowing me to speak. I know there's considerable controversy surrounding this talk. This is a full audience. All right, let's get right to it. My thesis tonight is simple and should be uncontroversial. Faith, faith-based beliefs, are not processes that are reliable. Let me repeat that. Faith-based belief processes are unreliable and will not lead one to the truth. Before I go on, I want to say a few preliminary comments. I am not a relativist. Relativism is the view that all, all points of view are equally valid and that all truth is relative to the individual. If you're a relativist and you've come here tonight, there's nothing I will say that will be persuasive to you. I also do not do meta-epistemology. This is not about meta-epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Meta-epistemology is the study of the study of knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> Meta-epistemology affects about 200 people. My point in a narrow area. My point is to address the remainder of humanity, a large percentage of whom are entrenched in faith-based beliefs. I am aware that there is an entire line of literature about meta-epistemology, and you can come, you can take my ethics class, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. OK. The only word that you really need to know tonight, it's a philosopher word, it's a $2 word, is epistemic. It means of or related to knowledge and knowing. Of or related to knowledge or knowing. And finally, I want to say one other thing that perhaps may be a little surprising. I am completely willing to change my mind about anything in this talk, provided there's sufficient evidence to do so. All right, now let's return to my thesis. Faith-based processes are unreliable. Faith-based processes are unreliable. What do I mean by unreliable? I mean that they will decrease the likelihood that one will have true beliefs. They will decrease the likelihood that one will have true beliefs. I'm going to demonstrate this tonight by talking about various methods of reasoning. OK, so let's think about this. Are there ways of solving problems? Are some ways of solving problems better than other ways of solving problems? Are some ways of solving problems better than other ways of solving problems? What do I mean by better? I mean that they will increase the likelihood that one will come to true beliefs. In order to answer this question, let's take a step back. Let's ask ourselves a very basic, simple question. Are there worse ways of reasoning? Are there worse ways of trying to figure out solutions to problems? Let's take a very, very simple example. The measurements of my bathroom door. For those of you who have come to my house, you can verify this. The, my bathroom door has a massive hole in it. I have no idea how the hole got there. I've always wanted to know. But it has a hole in it. And I, it's, it, I've lived there for about two years. It truly is on my to-do list. <laughs> OK. So I need to figure out the measurements of the door, and to figure out the measurements of the door so that I can get a replacement door that will fit in the frame of the door. Pretty straightforward problem, pretty clear. Are there worse ways to figure out what the measurements of my door are? Yeah. Well, here's one. Ask my dog. <laughs> Really? Two, divination. I'm going to take sticks. I'm going to scoop up some sticks from my backyard. I'm going to throw them up in the air. I'm going to see where they land. And I'm going to divine the answer from the sticks. It's a worse way of reasoning. Worse way of reasoning number three. I'm going to figure out the measurements of my door are sacrifice a goat. OK. Worked for the Aztecs. 
do people use worse ways of reasoning for themselves? Yeah, all the time. People use worse ways of conceptualizing and thinking through problems all the time. Here's one example of a worse way of thinking or a worse way of reasoning. People do this for themselves and they also do this for their loved ones. <laughs> this is an actual book. Okay. How do we know that astrology is unreliable? Well, the answer to this is the same for virtually every slide. We look at the evidence. You want, to, you want to figure something out, you look at the evidence. Here's one piece of evidence. Sharon Carlson's A Double Blind Test of Astrology was published in Nature in 1985. Had 116 people, gave them the California Personality Index, asked them the date, time, and place of their birth. And guess what? Astrologers matched, or attempted to match the birthday with the Personality Index. Do you think that they were successful? No. Some of them were, but no more so than random chance. Here's another worse way of reasoning. Homeopathy. What is homeopathy? Well, it's a highly, highly diluted substance that's used to treat illness. Just to be clear about what I mean by highly diluted, it contains no active ingredients whatsoever. Zipperino, none. If I were to urinate in the ocean, it would contain, it would be more concentrated than a homeopathic sugar pill. And some people think that it's an herbal medicine. It's not an herbal medicine. This is fantastic. This is a homeopathy emergency kit. <laughs> In case there's an emergency. Well, how do we know that homeopathy is unreliable? Well, the answer is simple. You look at the evidence. Here's one piece of evidence. Homeopathy for childhood and adolescent ailments. A systematic review of randomized clinical trials from the Mayo Clinic proceedings of 2007. This is, the evidence for this is not just suggestive, but it's conclusive. It's overwhelming. It's an unreliable process. It is not effective. Here's another worse way of reasoning. Dowsing. You can douse for anything you want. You can douse for oil. You can douse for water. People have even tried to douse for elephants. Basically, here's what you do with dowsing. You have a stick in one hand, or a stick in two hands, two sticks, and then you walk around. Ooh, elephants, uh, oil, look, dowsing for oil. And when the sticks cross, evidently that's the place that has the oil. Okay. But dowsing is unreliable. How do we know it's unreliable? Well, we examine the evidence. We look at the evidence. Here's just one piece of evidence. James Randi's an encyclopedia of claims, frauds, hoaxes, and the occult, and the supernatural, published by St. Martin's Press in 1995. James Randi has been investigating these phenomena for decades, and he's a hero to many of us, myself included. He also offers $1 million, a $1 million prize, to anyone who can show, under proper observing conditions, evidence of any paranormal, supernatural, or occult power. Many have tried, no one has ever been successful. I will say that I'm willing to change my mind about this, provided sufficient evidence. And I always tell my students, huh, what would it take to change your mind? Okay, what would it take to change my mind? Well, if they pass the James Randi test, that would be sufficient for me. Okay, so what can we tease out of these three examples? Astrology, homeopathy, and dowsing. Huh. Unreliable processes lead to unreliable conclusions. Unreliable processes lead to unreliable conclusions. That is, if the process one uses is unreliable, the conclusions one comes to cannot be relied upon. Cannot. For example, if one wants to cure an illness, an infection, with this homeopathic woo-woo, this will be the result. Nothing. <laughs> because it doesn't work. So let's take a look at the process of dowsing. Dowsing is unreliable. If the conclusion, think about this, the process of dowsing is me walking around trying to find dowsing. The conclusion is where the sticks cross. That's the conclusion. The process, the thing that got me there, is the actual act of dowsing. 
if the process that one uses to understand reality is not reliable, then every conclusion that springs from that process is also, let me hear it. Unreliable. Excellent. Unreliable. Think back to my bathroom door. If I use an unreliable process to ascertain the measurements of my door, there's a proliferation of answers to the question of how big the door should be. And virtually all of these answers will be incorrect. They'll be incorrect because the process that I used to get the measurements of my door was... Unreliable. Excellent. I use the word virtually because it's possible to use a bad process and get lucky. It's entirely possible. I could go outside, I could scoop up a number of sticks, I could throw them up. Lo and behold, it could be, it is possible, that I had scooped up exactly the number of sticks as is the height or width of the door. It's entirely possible. All right, at this juncture, we need to take a pause and think to ourselves, what are our ap epistemic goals? What are our goals knowledge-wise? We have twin goals. Every single person in here has two goals. The first is that we want to maximize the number of true beliefs that we have. We all want to have a maximum number of beliefs that were true. But if this is our only goal, then we could just believe everything we read, think, and hear. But our situation is far more complicated than this. Because we have a second goal. That we want to minimize the number of false beliefs that we have. So we want to maximize the number of true beliefs and we want to minimize the number of false beliefs. We want to have the fewest number of false beliefs possible, but again, this doesn't mean not believing anything because that would mean we wouldn't have any true beliefs. Well, let's go revisit the example that we started off with, the bathroom door. We established that there are bad ways to answer this question. By bad, I mean ways of thinking about this problem that will not enable me to figure out the measurements of a replacement door that will actually fit in the frame. To get the measurements of a door that will fit, I'll need to use a reliable process. Here are some examples of more reliable processes for my door. Number one, tape measure. Even I, the least mechanical person around, the least home repair guy, I have a tape measure. Take the tape measure, drag it to the top of the door, drag it to the bottom, put it in your iPhone, or still write, write it down. <laughs> Two, Google. Maybe the door is a prefab door. Maybe it's from Home Depot or Lowe's and has some kind of number on it. Three, ask an expert. There's my expert right there very dear friend of mine and a contractor who's done fantastic work on our house, Rick June. <laughs> Contrast this, for example, with someone who's never looked at the door and who won't look at the door. Is this guaranteed to work? No. One could always make a mistake. Your iPhone could auto-correct it. <laughs> but again, think back to our twin epistemic goals. We want to decrease the number of false beliefs we have, and we want to increase the number of true beliefs that we have. To do this, we cannot use processes that are unreliable. So at this juncture, you've probably anticipated an obvious question. Are there any commonalities among processes that take one away from reality? Are there any commonalities among processes that take one away from re reality? Processes that decrease the likelihood that the conclusion one comes to will be true. Well, yeah, there are two. The first is that these processes are not based on evidence. Processes that take one away from reality are not based on evidence. The second commonality is that they're based upon what one thinks is evidence, but is not actually evidence. I term such ostensibly benign superstitious beliefs gateway beliefs. <laughs> The Easter Bunny is an example of a conclusion for which certain epistemic agents, certain people, think that there's sufficient evidence. In a paper currently under peer review, I argue that starting out with seemingly inconsequential beliefs for which one lacks sufficient evidence may lay the framework for one to cognitively habituate oneself to lending one's belief to other propositions or other things which, also, which one also thinks that there's sufficient evidence when no such evidence exists.
Now we have finally set the groundwork to talk about faith. What is faith? Well, faith is belief without evidence. If one had evidence, one wouldn't need faith. Usually one refers to this as uh, particularly salient with matters of divine importance, matters of supreme importance. Faith is unreliable. Faith is an unreliable process. It will not point one in the direction of the truth. To demonstrate this, I will make several factual statements. And I think that every single person in here will agree with what I'm going to say. One, there are various faith traditions. There are different faith traditions. Two, people sincerely believe their faith tradition. It seems incredibly uncontroversial. People have sincere beliefs that their faith tradition is true. They accept as true those propositions in their faith tradition. Three, competing claims. Faith traditions make competing claims. Here's one very simple example. Muslims believe that Muhammad was the last prophet. Mormons believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. But let's look at the dates. The dates don't line up. And that's from Surah 3340. They cannot both be true. It cannot both be the case that Muhammad is the last prophet and that Joseph Smith is a prophet. Someone born after him was a prophet. These things cannot all be true. It's possible, however, that they can all be false. In fact, almost all claims, or all of them, must be false. But I'm not just going to claim they're false tonight. I'm going to claim that they're delusions. What do I mean by a delusion? Delusions have three criteria. This is from Carl Jaspers, psychiatrist and philosopher. I'm going to spend a minute on these. Certainty, incorrigibility, and implausibility. Certainty. People are positive that it's true. Incorrigibility. An ability to revise a belief. And the more of this literature that I look into, I'm beginning to think that this is absolutely the most important of the three. And implausibility. Bizarreness. Is the belief bizarre? I want to say briefly that the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the, the main purpose of the DSM is to provide common terms and standard criteria for classifying mental disorders. The DSM grants religious exemptions to delusions. <laughs> I disagree with granting religious ex delusion as an exemption, and I want to mention there's a budding young scholar here at Portland State University, Renee Barnett, who's working to eliminate the exemption from religious delusion from the DSM, and I'm helping her to do so. Thank you. That said, if a belief, regardless of the content, meets the three criteria, we are forced to conclude that a tremendous number of people are delusional. There's no other conclusion one can draw from the premises I've just outlined. And because the belief is shared, doesn't make it any less delusional. If everyone believes there's an alien in the courtyard, and then they convince Sue that there's an alien in the courtyard, that doesn't increase the likelihood that there's an actual alien in the courtyard. Each additional person who shares the belief that there's an alien in the courtyard does not make the belief more likely to be true. But one of the things that's interesting about this is that this doesn't deter people. It doesn't deter them from un coming to understand that they're delusional. Not in, fa in fact, not at all. Th they'll always claim others are delusional. He's delusional. The all those people over there, they're delusional. Not me. <laughs> I am definitely not delusional. My beliefs are in perfect alignment with reality. Okay. There are three core reasons for why one believes one faith tradition is true. Now, I, I, I've been teaching, I've taught over 33,000 people for 22 years. I take this both from my experience and from the literature. Reason number one. 
miracles. We're going to examine a few miracles. Catholics believe that the communion wafer, this is official church doctrine, is the literal physical body of Christ. It's called the doctrine of transubstantiation. I heard, actually heard Ryan mention it in the intro. This is the physical body of Christ that gets transformed from the wafer into flesh that they then eat. Okay. Let's take a look at another one. Speaking in tongues. Pentecostals believe that they can speak in tongues. They get this, they get this notion from 1 Corinthians 12. Yep. It's amazing. They always sound like Italian. It sounds like Italian. <laughs> Faith healing is another one. Christian scientists participate in this. The basic idea of faith healing is that through your love of Jesus Christ, someone will come and lay hands on you, and then whatever incurable illness that you have will vaporize, or who knows? I, don't, I never understood it. Okay. So let's take a look back at the three things that we discussed before. Certainty, incorrigibility, and implausibility. Does one hold this belief with certainty? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. You'd have to ask somebody. You'd have to ask someone, are, they, are you certain that this transforms into, from, from a wafer into a physical body? Yes, I am certain. Okay, cha-ching. Encourageability. Are you willing to revise your belief? Are you willing to revise that belief? And again, this is a case-by-case -case basis. I certainly can't say overall, but in my experience, most people to this, they would say no. Implausibility or bizarreness. Is it bizarre that someone believes that they can make utterances in a dead language that they have had no exposure to? Cha-ching! <laughs> These are all testable claims. They're testable. We can use the tools of science to figure these things out. Spoiler alert. False. They've all been shown to be false. Once one makes a judgment of a supernatural phenomena, those things in the phenomenal, in, in this world, they leave a footprint that then open us up to use the tools of science and reason to look at these things. They're testable and measurable. Let's take a look at a Catholic belief. Intercessory prayer. That's the idea of one person can pray for another person and then somehow the act of praying will heal the person. Well, we've actually tested that. The largest study ever, the Harvard Prayer Study in 2006, tested that. They looked at 1,802 bypass surgery patients. They found that prayer had no effect on recovery from surgery. Prayer is not effective. It is interesting that so few people have heard of this study. It's not received even anywhere near the publicity that it should have received. But what about speaking in tongues? What about speaking in tongues? Well, it's language-like, but it's not a language. Nichols, who has decades of experience investigating these sorts of claims, he's the senior research fellow for the Committee of Skeptical Inquiry. He wrote a great little piece that you should read, Looking for a Miracle, Weeping Icons, Relics, Stigmata, Visions, and Healing Cures. Speaking in tongues is gibberish. It's nonsense. But here's what I find really interesting about this whole thing. All of these things are delusions. They're all delusions. Each person views the other person's faith belief as a delusion. The Pentecostal who believes she can speak in tongues views the Catholic's belief that a wafer is literally transformed into the physical body of Christ as a delusion. And vice versa. Or the idea that Muhammad rode to heaven on a winged horse. That's in Surah 17.1. If one believes if, if one belongs to a faith tradition, one can and should scrutinize one's faith with the same tools of reason and by the same standards used to evaluate and reject other faiths. But people don't. Why would one not see one's faith delusions as delusions? You can easily see other faiths as delusions. There are many reasons for this. We can take a look at cognitive neuroscientists, psychology, philosophy, all right, 
But we'll pause and move to the second reason people have for claiming that their faith tradition is true. Conviction. Conviction. But conviction is evidence of nothing but conviction. Conviction is evidence of nothing but conviction. One's unshakable belief that one can see Christ or Zeus or the Emperor of Japan working in one's life is not evidence that the belief is true. This is evidence of nothing except the fact that one happens to believe whatever it is that one thinks one believes. This is part of the delusion. One's conviction is evidence of the strength of the delusion and not evidence for the truth of the delusion. Confidence does not map on to accuracy. Third reason, inerrant. Everyone thinks their particular faith tradition is inerrant. Inerrant, perfect, can't be improved upon. I want to take a moment right now to talk about this. Let's take a look at just a quick way that one can think critically about these things. Let's say I want to look at, are the prophecies in the Bible true? We already established that there are bad ways to do this and good ways. There are bad ways to think about problems. Here's a bad way to think about the problem. Go out and read only those books that already agree with the conclusions that you've come to. It's called confirmation bias. It's called confirmation bias. And as I read more and more about this in my career, I'm, I'm becoming convinced that this is an extremely important issue that needs to be dealt with. Here is a much better way to think about the problem. I want to figure out if the prophecies in the Bible are true. Here's what I should do. If you want to read some, someone who says the prophecies are true, that's fantastic. That's what you should do. Go out and read, I don't know, Josh McDowell or read, so take Josh McDowell. Go out and read Josh McDowell. Okay. But then people stop there. Don't stop there. That's just the beginning of what you need to do. The next thing you need to do is you need to read people on the other side, like Bart Ehrman or Richard Carrier or any of these people. You need to read people who have beliefs that don't agree with the conclusion that you started with. That's an investigation. That's what an inquiry is. But again, don't stop there. Don't stop there. Go back then to the original source material and see how Josh McDowell responded to those criticisms. Then you are engaged in a process of trying to find out what the truth is. That's a way to think about the problem. And I admit, it's a tremendous amount of intellectual work. It takes time, to be sure. No question about it. So where does this leave us? Where are we now? Well, there's an inevitable trajectory here. There's an inevitable trajectory. Almost every conversation, people want to talk to me about this constantly. This and unfortunately not enough science fiction, but this, the people want to talk to me about this constantly. Here's the trajectory of the conversation. Invariably, it starts off, my faith is true. After about, I don't know, depends on the person, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something really interesting will happen. The conversation will go from, my belief is true, and it won't be a clear demarcation. It won't be like an acknowledgement, well, you know, I guess I thought this, but it's not correct. No, from my, my faith is true, my belief is true, to my faith is beneficial. Well, my Uncle George plays poker with the guys at church and he likes it. Or he's in, This is the inevitable trajectory of every single conversation. Period. But I'm sticking with my thesis tonight. And I am not going to allow the Q&A to be held hostage by people who want to do a fast trick and try to claim that it's beneficial. My thesis is that it's an unreliable process that will not lead you to the truth. But I have a prediction. I have actually two predictions for you. My first prediction is, in spite of me having spent like three minutes on this, people are still going to go up to the mic and tell me how it's benefited them. <laughs> I have another prediction. That in spite of the fact that everybody knows my prediction ahead of time, <laughs> it's not going to stop it. The most charitable thing that we can say about faith, the most charitable thing, is that it's likely to be false. <laughs> faith does not make you a better person. My lack of faith in Jesus does not make me a bad person. It doesn't make me a good person either. Your faith in Jesus does not make you 
a good person or a bad person. Faith does not make you a better person. Faith is just an unreliable process. That's all it is. This has nothing to do with being a better person or not. So what? Okay, so what? Where are we left now? Well, if you don't already use faith as a process to navigate reality, I have an incredibly simple piece of advice for you. It couldn't possibly be any simpler. When you do engage people of faith, be honest, blunt, direct, and truthful. Give them the same reciprocity that, that in which they engage you. I always go out of my way to talk to the guy who screams or the people in the park. I think it's great. And they're always very honest with me. And I treat them with the same thing in kind. It's true. I also want to say that it's really important that you ought to model the behavior that you would like to see in others. Specifically the idea that you're willing to reconsider. I'm always open to think that, that someone knows something I don't know. If someone knows something I don't know, I want to know it because I want to lawfully align my beliefs with reality. But don't just stop there. Tell them about the advantages of reason and rationality. Don't leave them in the cold. Reason and evidence can replace faith. Reason and evidence can replace faith. If you have faith-based beliefs, thank you for coming. Tonight is an opportunity for you to jettison your faith. <laughs>